Welcome to the Future of Field Service podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Nicastro. Today, we are going to be talking about the art of IT. Yes, you heard that correctly. We're going to be talking about how IT relates to art. Uh, I'm excited to welcome to the podcast today, Catherine Wood, who is the service owner for engineered deployment at Compugen. Catherine, welcome to the Future of Field Service podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, so before we we talk about uh, where the worlds of art and IT collide, um, why don't you uh, say hello to our listeners, tell them a little bit about yourself and your role with Compugen. Sure. Uh, well, I've been with Compugen for 15 years. Uh, before that, I was with IBM. I am currently the service owner for engineered deployment. So installations, deinstallations across the country, very technical services role. Um, that's about it. I've been in IT for about 20 years, okay. <laughs> 25 years. All right. So let's talk about your life before IT. Um, so I found this interesting when we connected. Um, it hasn't always been IT for you. Uh, you went to school for fine arts um, and you were a teacher at one point. So Tell us a little bit about that and how this transition to the world of IT occurred. Yeah, it's been a <laughs> it's been a strange road. Um, I went to school for fine art. I, I loved art, always have, but I've always been interested in computers um, since I was a kid. Uh, when I was uh, finished school and started having a family, I wanted to go back to work after my kids were in school. So I took uh, computer courses at a local co computer college. Uh, but I just to be able to use, you know, the, the use a computer again, been a while. Uh, but I got a job as a teacher teaching art. So I was teaching art for a while and I moved to a couple of different schools. But at one point I was teaching at a private school and their computer teacher left and they knew I had this computer background. So they asked me to fill in and they needed a teacher fast. So I all of a sudden became a computer teacher and it turned into me only being a computer teacher after a few years. And from there I went to IBM and, uh, and now I'm here. And the rest is history. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So the, this correlation between um, art and IT. So you said that one of the reasons you love IT is because for you, it requires the same type of creativity that art does. So um, talk a little bit more about what you mean by that. Um, well, it, first of all, the exciting part to me is you can do anything with a computer you know, whether that's programming or automating, um, it, it's, it's very creative. You just, all you have to do is dream it up. Mm -hmm. uh, computer programming is, is just another medium. It's just like oil painting or water painting or writing or film. It's just another medium. And it requires that somebody dreams up something new to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, and it, so it requires that creative process right at the beginning. What do I want to do? What problems am I trying to solve? And and from there, then you decide on the technical pieces and you put the technical pieces together about how to build it. But the dreaming it up, that that's absolutely creative. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you paint. Um, yeah. So when you are going to paint do you have in mind what you want to create uh yes me personally i do now not not everybody is like that some people mm -hmm. get in front of a canvas and they just start mm -hmm. uh me personally i i do i i have an idea in mind i have something i want to say mm -hmm. uh something i want to communicate so i will start with sketches and an outline and sometimes you do color samples and you do uh you know you test different things on test canvases absolutely plan it all okay. out and beforehand yeah i was just thinking about you know kind of the the consideration of those two mediums if you will so thinking about your process when you paint and and the process of of an it project right and right. sort of you know, you have a vision in mind for where you want to be. 
and that process of working towards it um, and the use of technology as a medium is sort of like the creative journey. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, there, it, it just, the reason I was asking is I was thinking if you had a different type of creative process where you just sat down and painted and you didn't know what you were trying to get out before you start, well, sure. I mean, if you're going out and you're painting something spontaneously or you're, you're painting outside or you're, um, but you're still choosing what it is you want to do. Mm-hmm. You're, mm-hmm. you're not, uh, you're not trying to create a great work of art or necessarily you're trying to paint what's in front of you. Um, so it, yeah, that in that case, you're not doing a lot of planning other than making sure that you have all the tools you need with you. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. there's still that and you have to know you have to be skilled enough with the medium that you're working with too whether Mm -hmm. that's paint or whether that's computer program uh, computers or it in general Mm -hmm. what is it capable of doing so that i know when i get inside in front of something that i can do whatever it is i want to do Mm -hmm. yeah it just it's interesting because it, it had me thinking a bit about um, and I know agile becomes a tricky word, but, uh, you know, just the idea of kind of um, what you can find or learn as you're going through the process. So I guess the idea of of maintaining some level of, um, you know, uh, flexibility, right? So as you embark on a journey, either journey, you know, you're going to kind of create as you're going along to some extent, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, okay. Um, Actually, an interesting point about that. So part of creativity is not creating something right up front, like Mm -hmm. starting to sit it down and and write a program or, Mm -hmm. or build something. Uh, But how you're going to find creative solutions for the limitations or the the challenges that come come up. And I think that speaks to the agile piece that you're talking about Mm -hmm. there, where coming up with creative solutions to things that that come up in front of you are really part of the creative process and all Mm -hmm. part of it, right? Mm -hmm. You're, You're constantly creative as you're trying to problem solve. Okay. So let's, let's talk about this idea of creativity for a minute. So I, you know, you hear people say, well, I'm not creative. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And then there's people that wholeheartedly identify themselves as a creative, right? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two, two ends of that spectrum. Um, do you feel like people either are or aren't creative? Do you feel everyone is? And it's just a matter of whether it's tapped or untapped. Like, what do you kind of think about that? Um, well, yeah, people look at me like I have two heads. <laughs> I'm creative in an IT that can't possibly work. How does that work? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I innately feel that everybody has a creativity that they, they don't necessarily recognize in themselves. I mean, as somebody who builds their own deck or renovates a house or even cooks or bakes or how about uh, creates a PowerPoint presentation because they, they have to for business. Um, to do that, those are all creative endeavors. And mm-hmm. I think people fail to recognize in themselves when they're creative. I hear that all the time, right? I can't even draw a stick figure. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not good at that. But people are creative in so many different ways. They just don't recognize it. And so they don't give themselves that credit. And they don't mm-hmm. have the confidence to say that I can create something new when they do it every day in other areas of their life. Mm-hmm. So I think confidence is a really good point. Um, but if we take that a layer deeper, I think that this idea of, you know, how creativity fits into the way you just explained it into all of these different work projects and processes that we do or could be responsible for. Part of it is confidence. Um, it's kind of like, you know, a muscle, the more you the use it, you use it, the stronger it gets. But I think sure. the other thing is, um, in terms of kind of corporate culture, it isn't necessarily um, urged in the sense of, you know, an employer may think it's great if they have a creative employee, but they're mm-hmm. not necessarily giving people 
the space or the fail safe environment that they might need to feel that they have the latitude to explore their creativity or build that creative confidence. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, creativity is, well, has all been traditionally um, not thought of in business or in IT. So I definitely think there's some, some it's undervalued there mm-hmm. uh, for sure. I think that's changing. Um, the employers are starting to see where creativity needs to come in to problem solve. And if you look at any CEO or anything else to be able to, to change is a creative action itself, but it is undervalued. But I think that it also takes a, a leadership team or the leadership needs to be able to provide the trust, right? Mm -hmm. People need to be able to trust that they can take chances and that they can try things and fail and, you know, fail fast and recover. And, you know, that's all creativity, but that comes from the leadership down. Absolutely. The other thing is um, that I really think is the organizations don't tend to value that time where, um, uh, uh, someone is sitting in themselves and mm-hmm. just giving themselves the space to stop and think. And people have been told our whole lives, right? If you're sitting there doing nothing, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You're not doing nothing. You're uh, you're thinking about you're problem solving. You're thinking about things. Your mind is wandering. You're making connections that you wouldn't be able to make if you didn't give your mind that kind of space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's such a big part of it. You know, everyone's busy, everyone's over, overtaxed, you know, and it can be really hard um, as individuals and then for organizations to prioritize the sort of white space it takes, you know, to have time to think creatively. Um, Definitely something that I struggle with a little bit. I always block time in my calendar and never keep it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So is there um, any tips you have either, again, as an individual or as a leader for how to give yourself um, some of that creative space or provide that creative space to your employees? Well, for myself, it really is that, you know, set the time in your calendar and, um, and and keep it right you need to have time to to think about things to problem solve to strategize right all of that kind of thing you need to give yourself that space um for my uh my teams um i try and um for p for team members that really aren't aren't comfortable doing that or don't have time, I'll try and get on a call with them and brainstorm with them and then, and then give them the time and space to, to take it away and say, look, this is a priority that we, that we solve this or that we find a strategy for this. So, you know, we'll start to brainstorm and, Hey, why don't you take that away and see what else you can do with it? What else can you come up with? And, mm-hmm. and that's sort of encouraging that, that creativity time and, hopefully they they understand that they can take that and they can take the space to do that right mm-hmm. it is a priority and it it's a part of their job yeah that makes sense can you share an example um of what it looks like to use your creativity in practice in IT at Compugen <laughs> oh it's pretty messy <laughs> <laughs> um uh I, I use a lot of whiteboards <laughs> and uh, when we were, you know, locked down in the pandemic, one of the first things I did was run out and uh, order. Now I have a lot of easels around, so I have an easel in front of my desk here and buy all sorts of big newsprint and colored markers. And so when I do book myself that, that time that I need to, uh, I need to write it down or I need to see something visually, or I can do a mind map or, Mm -hmm. you know, where I'm just brainstorming with myself and trying to let my mind, you know, free flow, um, different concepts and different words. And, and then I can sit back and I'm a visual person, obviously I'm a painter. So, Mm -hmm. um, I can sit back and I can look at it again and, and, 
from a distance and say, oh, yeah, okay, that works or that doesn't work or, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, what was I thinking? <laughs> but yeah. um, I'm, I'm a visual person, so I, I use those kinds of mediums to try and, to try and uh, work on, on something creative if I'm doing it. Just the same as I would if I'm painting, where I'm going to do a bunch of sketches beforehand and sort of sketch it out, what works, what doesn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That makes sense. So let's talk a little bit, I guess, shifting gears slightly. Um, when you first transitioned into IT, uh, we talked about the fact that, um, so you said that was 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said you were often the only woman in the room. Mm -hmm. So how much or little would you say that that has changed? Uh, it has changed. Uh, it's slow, <laughs> but it, it has changed. Um, I'm, I'm not as often the only woman in the room. Um, men are more comfortable seeing women in IT and, uh, um, and we're, we're seeing more women in leadership roles which is mm -hmm. in IT, which sort of gives other women the confidence to be able to say, hey, I can see myself there or, or I can succeed in this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. It still happens, right, where you get questioned. But, uh, and even just a few weeks ago, I, had, I was in a meeting and um, someone tried to explain to me where the start menu is. He knew we work. He knew we both work in IT. He knows mm -hmm. the company I work for. He knows my role, and he's explaining to me how to find the start menu. Mm -hmm. um, I don't keep quiet in those situations, right? I mm -hmm. I used to when I was younger, but I don't anymore. And I really asked him as politely as possible. You know, I asked him, "What makes you think that I that you need to explain to me where the start menu is?" I and I know he was uncomfortable. He was. Mm -hmm. Um, but I said, Hey, look, if, if you're wondering, ask before you explain something like, mm -hmm. like this, right? So it is changing. When I first started at Computon, there was no women in upper leadership and, and there are now, and that goes across the industry. Mm -hmm. And so it's so exciting and women bring new, uh, perspectives and new problem solving and, and uh, new experiences to it that I think mm -hmm. really expands, uh, and help solve the problems of the world that we're all trying to deal with right now. But uh, yeah, there's still ways to go. <laughs> work to do. Yes. Yeah, work to do. What would you say have been the biggest challenges of often being the only woman in the room? Mm, I'm, I often feel I have to give my resume every time I'm in a new room. And, uh, and I'm asked questions that, uh, that nobody would think of asking a man because if he's in that room, he's already qualified to be in that where uh, they see a woman walk in and they think, oh, she can't possibly be technical or she can't possibly know anything about this. Um, women get talked over. We still get spoken, uh, talked over in meetings or dismissed or someone will say something and we'll get ignored. Um, the conversation will just keep going. Um, those are still challenges that we deal with today. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, you, you hear a lot about, um, you hear the term like microaggressions, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is, it is really true. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that get said that, you know, I question, would somebody say that to a man, you yeah. know, and it's not always malicious, but that doesn't change the impact of it, you know? No. And so it's very easy to say or think, oh, they probably didn't mean it that way, right. you know? But it's still harmful, you know, even if, if there isn't malintent behind it. Um, well, and isn't that just uh, the, the same boys will be boys kind of excuse? Like they didn't mean it that way. Just move on, get over it. It's if it happened once in my lifetime, I'd get over it. Sure. When it happens multiple times a day, it starts to have an impact on me. And maybe it's multiple people during the day, and they all didn't mean it. But the the challenge is changing, um, changing everyone's understanding of what that is, mm -hmm. not dismissing the fact that it has an impact. 
Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the people it's happening to. Yeah. So you gave the example of, um, the, the start menu the other day and speaking up about that. And you said you wouldn't have always spoke up. No. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, how did you, how, what do you think helped you find that voice, you know, and, and be more comfortable using it? And, you know, what might you say to uh, a younger woman who's starting a career in, you know, a, a male dominated field in terms of, you know, not maybe waiting as long to, to speak out or speak up? Um, hmm. Those are a few different questions in there. Yeah. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let me see. I might start with the second one. Okay. It, with a, what I would say to someone who's younger than me is advice based on, you know, what I had to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Which is uh, first be a sponge at learn everything that you can from every interaction, because there's always something that you're going to take to the next meeting, mm -hmm. to the next project to So learn everything that you can. And, um, uh, the other thing is, uh, don't worry about it. If you ask a question and you think it's stupid mm -hmm. or, uh, forgive yourself. If you make a comment and somebody gives you a look like I ask of that, just let it uh, forgive yourself because mm -hmm. we are so hard on ourselves that we're going to say the wrong thing or somebody's going to think less of it. Nobody's thinking that nobody in the room knows everything. Everybody contributing makes, uh, it goes towards that, that shared goal, right. Of solving the problem of moving that project to completion of great customer experience, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, uh, so speak up, even if you think that it's, uh, that it's stupid or it's wrong, it's a bad question, or maybe you're wrong. Um, I was in the room and, and what, so to address the first question, mm -hmm. um, what did it for me was leadership, uh, people who would call someone out in a meeting who hadn't been, who hadn't spoken, do a round table at the end of the meeting. So that everybody gets a chance to, to vocalize something, mm -hmm. right? What do you think? Okay. And what do you think? And what do you think? And, and leadership that would say, Hey, uh, Catherine, we haven't heard from you. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have anything? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. And the more you do it, the more confident you get. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the, so leadership goes a long way towards a making, giving people that confidence, yeah. men and women, young men have the same problem, but right. men and women giving young people the, the confidence to speak up and say something uh, in these projects and in these meetings. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point because, you know, it's, it, it, some of this issue, you know, the issue of, of learning to use your voice, you know, yes, it's, it's something that everyone's personally responsible for, right. And, and you want to work on and work on doing well. Um, but that point I think is an important one because there are ways that leaders can really help enable that, you know, rather than just sitting back and waiting for everyone to, miraculously build their own confidence level enough to, to verbalize their thoughts and, and feelings. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, it, it's also a good point that, um, the, the idea of, of asking questions, you know, I've mm -hmm. shared a story a bunch of times about, you know, um, early, very early in my writing career. Um, it was actually the first, uh, like case study type ar article I ever wrote. And I didn't understand probably 80% of what the guy said to me in the interview, but I didn't want to seem stupid. So I just did a lot of, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I tried to write an article based on that. And the copy editor just threw it back at me and said, call him back. And I had to call him back. And, you know, so it, yeah. it was a good lesson in just asking. And, and once I became comfortable in really any situation, just saying, you know, I, I don't really understand what you mean. Can you explain it to me differently? Or, mm -hmm. you know, 
I've never come across someone that wasn't willing and it's helped me learn so much just by being able to, you know, ask for clarification or examples or details, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I think is the example that you shared from the other day with that gentleman, you know, um, I, I think it is important to, you know, you said he was uncomfortable. Um, and, and you're probably at a point in your career where you could have just as easy, easily ignored it or blown them off. Like you don't need to point that out to make yourself feel better or, or different. But I think it is important to do because in a lot of cases, um, like I said, there's, there's things that get said that, you know, it's not ill intent but it's unnecessary and it shouldn't happen. Right. And so it does take someone who has built up the confidence to speak out so that maybe that person thinks a bit about how they're coming across and, you know, um, can acknowledge that, that behavior. So. Right. And I wasn't trying to, I wasn't, my goal wasn't to make him uncomfortable, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, um, my goal was to, to gently educate him. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he wasn't doing it on purpose. He was right. trying to, he was trying to help. <laughs> he, he really thought he was trying to help, mm-hmm. but he just was going about it in a way that he needed to think about a little bit more Yeah, and be aware of. And, that's and, he, and he was probably uncomfortable because he cared about the fact that he had come across that way. That's right. If he was doing it maliciously, he probably wouldn't have been uncomfortable so much as combative or dismissive. You know, I right. think that discomfort comes from anytime you realize you've done something wrong and you yeah. care about what you've done, you know, you feel that that discomfort. And to your point from earlier, you know, you have to forgive yourself. You, right. you know, you, um, do as best as you can until you know better and then you do better. Right. So hopefully, yeah, that'll help him. Um, okay. A couple other questions. So, um, before you were with Compugen, you changed roles, um, pretty often because you liked variety, you liked new challenges. Um, and, and now you've been with Compugen for 15 years. Um, and so when I asked you kind of what, what made you stick around? Um, you know, we talked about the culture uh, and and how um, as a woman and especially a working mom, um, you know, the culture has been a really good fit for you. This is a conversation I think is very important because also being a woman and also being a working mom, um, you know, I started my um, motherhood in a career um, in a workplace that was not a very working mom friendly culture Mm -hmm. Um, and having, um, you know, come to be a part of IFS and and to be in this role, it's really honestly changed my life. I mean, it it has made me feel that I can excel in both my career and my role as a mom at the same time without constantly feeling like I'm sacrificing in um, any area. Of course, it's still a lot to juggle. I mean, we, we all know that, but it's at least mm-hmm. possible. Um, mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, as companies look to continue to, um, you know, bring more, more women into the workplace, particularly into IT roles and um, things like that, you know, what are some of the aspects of culture that, that you think are particularly important and beneficial? Uh, well, first and foremost, I would say flexibility. I mean, uh, women are responsible for so much when it comes to the family, rightly or wrongly. I'm not going to debate that one way or the other at the moment, but, uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to dentist appointments, doctor's appointments, um, you know, uh, dealing with schools, all of those kinds of things, they tend to fall, uh, more on the, on the mom, on the woman in the household, and so to be able to have an environment that you've got some flexibility with your sculpt, with your schedule, uh, whether that's, um, whether that's, we, here's your deadline, you meet your deadline and you mm-hmm. figure out how you're going to meet that deadline 
or whether it's just you are in an environment where if you have to say, I have to run out to my child's school, something happened, you know, they just fell off the the, the swing set or something. Uh, and you can say that without fearing for your job or that, you know, it's going to, uh, it's going to negatively impact your career. Uh, Compugen, the, the flexibility that I was uh, afforded in my first few, first few roles is, uh, was, went a long way to that. Mm -hmm. Like it really, it gave me a quality of life and feel and quality to my children's life and my family that I could be there for them. And that only made me want to want to work for Computin even more and even mm -hmm. harder and mm -hmm. uh, do everything I could to help the organization succeed. Yeah. Um, it, it, and I think organizations miss that, right? Mm -hmm. They really, some organizations who don't do that really miss the point that doing that will make pe employees work so much harder for you. Yeah, it pay, it pays dividends. It I really, does. really believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Compution has uh, employees who have been there for well, and I still feel like the new girl at fifteen mm -hmm. years because they've got fifteen, twenty, twenty five, thirty. There's a lot of employees that stay and stay for a long time, and that's a real indication of uh, a great corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of it. The other part of it that made me stay personally is, uh, you know, I worked in all these different jobs and different roles. And I think this is career number six for me overall. Uh, and, and that's, I like variety. So I mm -hmm. don't have a role right now. And I haven't in the last 15 years where it's the same day every day. I'm not doing the same thing all day, every day, that kind of, uh, the, the kind of variety and choose what I'm working on right now. I mean, I have a list that mm -hmm. I've been given. I have to do all of this, but I don't have to do it all in a certain order. As long as I get them done by my deadlines or a new problem comes up that I have to solve or a new project comes up that has a different. So that gives me the variety to keep me interested and keep me excited uh, about what it is I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and there's, they afford me opportunities to succeed. Like I have been in multiple roles in Computon. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to feel like I can grow my career, that I'm valued, that I'm respected. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that, uh, all of that is, is the corporate culture in Computon specifically, which mm -hmm. has really kept me here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think it's it's an interesting dynamic. You know, um, there's huge conversations happening right now around what will the future of work look like and how are we going to attract and hire and retain talent, you know, all over the board, right? From, from leadership all the way to the front line, you know, and I think this whole idea of reexamining company culture and and really thinking about what your employee experience is like and is it conducive to the type of experience that the level of talent you want to attract is is going to want for themselves you know and you know some of the things we're talking about it's not you know trips to Aruba every year and, you know, $50,000 bonus. I mean, it's, it's nothing ridiculous that, that is so important. They are things that are absolutely attainable, right? Um, if, if people are just willing to kind of reflect and, and think through and, and, you know, that sort of thing. So mm. I think it's important for, uh, across the board, I think particularly the idea that that we talked about as working moms, you know, I think that um, we bring a lot to the table, but there's some some of those key factors that are going to be extra, extra important. And uh, I think the the point you made about being given that flexibility, making you only care and be more loyal is is absolutely true. Um, okay. Last question for today is um, as a leader, but I'm also going to ask you as an artist, what are your biggest sources of inspiration? Hmm. Um, people. <laughs> people are my biggest source of inspiration. As a leader, 
I really only want to be of service to people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's about um, it's about my team. It's about giving them everything they need to succeed personally and to be able to succeed uh, and, and for the organization to succeed and to guide them and to, to be of service to them. In my art and creativity, it's still people. Um, it's learning in so many different ways from so many different people. So mentorship means a lot to me. Uh, me mentoring because you get so much back when you mentor, mm-hmm. uh, but also me having a mentor and guidance and um, different kinds of medium like podcasts and books and other people's experiences that brings me so much inspiration for where I want to go and what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, people is my biggest source of inspiration, and it's also what I paint. I paint. Uh, I, I do a lot. Of, I, all of my paintings are revolve around the human form and portraiture and, and things like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, people. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Catherine. Well, thank you so much for joining me um, on the podcast today. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Thanks. You can find out more by visiting us at futureoffieldservice.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn as well as Twitter at the future of FS. The Future of Field Service podcast is published in partnership with IFS. You can learn more at ifs.com. As always, thank you for listening.